Hi, are you ready for more? This is Anna Maria Tremonti, and today we've got Malcolm Gladwell. What is it about that guy? Big ideas, big brain, big, big success. And still, if he's got a big ego, he hides it really well. He's so normal and nice. The kind of guy who would have a coffee with you and ask about your mom. But you know Malcolm Gladwell is a rock star in the world of publishing and now podcasting. And look at the resume, The Washington Post, The New Yorker, and then all those books, The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, and lately, Talking to Strangers. We have people struggling with their first impressions of a stranger. We have people struggling when they have months to understand a stranger. It's a mess. Malcolm Gladwell doesn't just hit the zeitgeist. He inhabits it. He directs it. Absolutely true. And the podcasts? I love revisionist history. And now he's empire building. He's got his own podcast company and he's called it Pushkin Industries. And throughout it all, Malcolm Gladwell, that nice guy, well, he's a contrarian. He challenges assumptions. He makes you look at things differently. And he's really vocal about the importance of changing your mind. My entire life, I've been obsessed with the fact that the conclusions you draw in the moment are almost invariably different from the conclusions you draw upon reflection. So I wanted to start there and see where that big brain of his would take us. And I think you'll agree, you can actually hear that brain working in this conversation. We went to a lot of places, the pitfalls of journalism, of Twitter, of getting it wrong, how he works through all those famous ideas, who he runs his stuff by first, and how working in audio now has changed his mind about how you tell a story. But hey, why should I tell you what he said when you can hear him yourself? So here we go, my conversation with Malcolm Gladwell, starting with, what the heck do I call him? Uh, is it the co-founder of Pushkin Industries? What's your title, yes. Pushkin? Co-founder. Co-founder, co-founder. Okay. That's the fancy word everyone uses now is founder. Which is yeah, sort of co-founder. It's good, though. You did, yeah, though, I, right? Yeah, I did, I did, yes. So Pushkin Industries, I've begun, uh-huh. by the way, we've begun. <laughs> Pushkin Industries, wh- why? Why that name? Well, uh, Pushkin is the name that my father gave to our first dog growing up in uh, Southern Ontario. And Pushkin was a um, half Labrador, half German Shepherd. Um, And he was a delightful dog. And uh, that started a whole tradition of my father naming all of our dogs after Russian um, literary figures. And Tolstoy... Chekhov, etc. But I always had a fondness for the name Pushkin. So I've named everything in my life Pushkin. Um, and uh, when it came to knowing me this company, I tried to get us to name it after Gramsci, a obscure early 20th century Marxist theoretician for no particular reason. But then everyone said, no, no, no. Who wants to call it Gramsci? Let's call it Pushkin. So it, Pushkin it is. Okay. So it's not because you loved the poetry of Alexander Pushkin. No, it's about the dog. It's, it's about, about the, the dog. dog. So I have yes. a fun fact for you on yeah. Pushkin. Do yeah. you know, I'm going to connect the dots between Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest yeah. poet, and hamburgers. Do you know the connection? I do not. In January of 1990, McDonald's opened its first store in the then Soviet Union. Uh Its first restaurant was huge. 5,000 people went to Mm -hmm. Pushkin Square because that's where it was. It was Pushkin Square. Pushkin Square. And they lined up for hamburgers. Everything. I was in Moscow last year and I discovered everything in Moscow was named after Pushkin. I felt an especial affinity for, for <laughs> Moscow because everything in my life, you know, I call them, everything in my life is named after Pushkin. So it's like we're on the same page. Do you still have a dog? Yeah. I do not, no. Yeah. Do you want a dog or are you just too, too busy to have a dog? Uh, I, I would like one, but I'm too busy to have one. There was one in the studio this morning named Fife, who's so delightful that I really just wanted to stay there and play with Fife. But I very, I'm very, i pro-dog, but I don't at the moment have one. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let's talk about you <laughs> um, and Pushkin. Um, you know, I look at your career from uh-huh. right up to revisionist history and your latest book, Talking to Strangers. Mm-hmm. A lot of what you do is about presenting another view, sometimes a contrarian view, but it's presenting an alternate reality. You want us to think and you want us to even change our minds on something significant. And you've said, Mm -hmm. actually, change your mind every day on something significant. I think it's, I think changing your mind is a very, very, very good idea. Yes. Like what? Um, 
you, you want me to give an example of yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a good one. So, I mean, it's very, it's very specific to, but, um, you know, I'm a big runner and I follow the world of competitive running very closely. And there was a big controversy uh, recently about a brilliant runner named Mary Kane, who used to run for Nike's main track club, Nike Oregon Project. And it went very badly for her and she kind of fell from sight. And then she had a thing in the New York Times last week where she talked about how badly she was treated by Nike Oregon Project, particularly in arguments about her weight and how they kind of shamed her about how she was too heavy to be a I'm a middle distance runner. And, you know, runners are obsessed with weight. And my initial reaction, without even thinking about it, was, oh, of course, I mean, that's dumb. You have to worry about your weight. Like, this is like PC culture getting in the way of, you know, the the nitty gritty of competitive running. And I had this very kind of like dismissive. Uh, and then I just started to read more and more about this subject, particularly from other women, runners, talking about this issue. And I realized I was totally wrong. I completely misunderstood what the issue was. I misunderstood the gravity of the situation. Um, I, didn't, I didn't appreciate the extent to which, you know, uh, women develop differently in their late teens and early 20s than men do. I mean, there's a whole host of things that I had simply not known about or overlooked or discounted or... Um, and. I, you know, had I tweeted out something in that first or written some quick response in that first instance, I would be now apologizing for it and saying I was wrong, right? You know, it's like, it's a very useful thing about like, before you say anything, you should be careful. I mean, you should, because I, I and I always wonder when that, things like that happen, I wonder how many of my other positions are like that. I hold them merely because I haven't thought about it. I don't know enough. And I haven't listened carefully enough to voices who could educate me. It's interesting, though, because in this specific area, you actually know a lot because you're a runner. And maybe sometimes the things that we have to change our minds about are things that we think we know so well yeah. that we might actually like not even like we would skim it, not even read it because we think we know. Right? Yeah. Well, there's, it's interesting. Yeah. So what what my status as a runner did is it gave me permission to hold a very dogmatic position. Because my initial thought was, oh, I know about this. I, so I can see the I can see through all of this BS and, you know, posturing. And so it, it's it's you're absolutely right. I it it would almost have been better. I would have been better off if I knew less. Right. I would never have taken a dogmatic position if I was just an ordinary person who followed running very casually. It was because I presumed myself to be an expert. What I didn't know was a the facts of this particular case, and B, I am a male runner, and I, my knowledge, I realized, was grounded in the male experience, and the female experience is quite different. Um, and, you know, when I started to read about, like, how she, when Mary Kane was under the tutelage of this coach, Alberto Salazar, she broke five bones. She's 18 years old, and she's being shamed about her weight, and, you know, when you start breaking bones, it suggests that you're undernourished, right? Yeah, like that yeah, you're, yeah, there's sure. something profoundly wrong with your physiology. So, like, I, I made up my mind with it before I even knew that she had broken five bones. I mean, it's, the whole thing is, I can't believe I'm telling you the story. It does not reflect well on Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's like... But you didn't tweet it out. <laughs> I did not tweet it out. I kept it to myself. Now I feel sheepish. But I also... I mean, I I don't actually, I feel sheepish in part, but I also feel greatly relieved and I feel like I'm in the right business. If I'm, if I'm in the business of helping people go through the same very useful process that I just went through, then I'm doing good work, right? I'm doing something that's positive. You are. And actually, again, it's interesting because we often think we we stereotype people with dogmatic views and we think often that they are uneducated. They don't know enough. And maybe sometimes they know too much, but yeah. they're it's a narrow band. Yeah. Well, overconfidence is... So there's two poles here. There is incompetence, which is not knowing enough. And there's overconfidence, which is thinking you know way more than you know, right? They are two profoundly different 
uh, positions. And overconfidence is actually far more dangerous than incompetence because incompetence, um, we're really good at locating it and weeding it out. And also incompetent people never rise to prominent positions, right? It's overconfident the people who get in positions of power. So like, that's actually the thing that ought to stress us out is is the possibility of someone believing themselves to be far more expert than they actually are that is that's much more the issue than that someone is is um, simply ignorant of what they need to know mm. so what where does that approach of looking at an issue from different perspectives and pushing for people to do that and maybe change their minds or be more open to another view where does that come from in you in me mm-hmm. uh I mean, I, I mean, I could give you an answer, but then, I mean, the standard answer is well, you know, you you credit your parents or your friends or your the quality of public schooling in Southern Ontario or some uh, all of those things are true, um, but I always but I've thought about this a lot recently and I. And I think in addition to that, though, I don't think I think the better question is the other question. If someone, I think I'm the way that people naturally are. And in my experience, most people are like that. Most people are actually open to new interpretations, surprisingly so. Um, and the what's, what's, what is unusual in my book is those who aren't. And those are the ones that require explanation. So a, a far better question is to say of someone whose mind is absolutely made up, how on earth did you get so dogmatic? Because that's weird. Because if human beings were dogmatic we would never have made it this far, right? So mm. the, the evolutionary state is to be curious. It's because, it's because we're open-minded and curious that we have electricity and telephones and, you know, uh, airplanes and antibiotics. It's, um, you will note, by the way, that of those, of the four things I selected as hallmarks of the modern age, two are Canadian. Yes, yeah, so you're a very proud Canadian. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. I, was, I, was, I was very selective in my choice of things that. Um, but uh, also, Br Brantford, where was Banting? Oh, it's Toronto. And it, Banting it's, it's and right, Best, yeah, yeah. In Insulin. Toronto. Mm hmm. And and uh, and Alexander Graham Bell in Brentford. Not only am I being Canadian, I'm being Southern. I'm being true to my Southern Ontario roots. Um, but so, if it's so central to our species to be open-minded and curious, how on earth do we end up from time to time with people who are the opposite? That's the interesting question. So I'm normal. So how on earth do we end up in a in a political a period of uh, uh, an era politically not just in the U.S. and Canada? Uh, yeah. Look at uh, where where you actually it it appears that people are more closed and not open and curious yeah. and more dogmatic. Like well, I I wonder. So I think it's in. I, I don't have a, a. I don't have a good answer. But two, I will say. I wonder whether this will seem like less of an issue in a few years. So does anyone seriously doubt, for example, that on the question of climate change, we'll eventually get to 95% of the population? We will. We're almost, it's all, you know, even if you compare today with a year ago today, it's a lot harder, I feel like today, to have this position than you than it would have been a year ago. I mean, we're eventually, we're all moving in the direction of being open to this new understanding of the world. It's just that some of us are moving faster than others. You know, my father was interested in and, and um, uh, worried about climate change years before I was, for example. Um, that's not because I was dogmatic. I just, it just didn't, I just didn't think about it or care about it or, and he was the one who was sounding the alarm. I mean, I feel like a decade ago he was, or more, I got, you know, much later, um, it took, took much later for me to come around. So, I mean, I, I feel like we're all moving in that direction only at different speeds and um, because of where we stand. Some, a lot of people who are maybe very resistant to that issue. Maybe they're extraordinarily progressive and open-minded on other issues. And we only have so much room in our life for that kind of ideological disruption. You need to ask, you need to look at all of their beliefs. You know, here's a really good example. Uh, 
the Catholic Church rejected contraception in the papal encyclical of 1968 or 69, um, in large part because of a ferocious lobbying attempt by a American cleric, Jesuit, named John Ford. John Ford got the Pope's ear and basically talked him out of saying yes to the pill. John Ford is this great, in that sense, is this great retrograde figure in uh, modern history. He's the one who took the largest institution, private institution in the world and, and, you know, and made it antagonistic to birth control. If you go back 20 years, 25 years, you discover that at the outset of the Second World War, John Ford was also the person who made this extraordinary prescient and brave argument against civilian bombing which was a generation ahead of its time, which the rest of the world did not come around to until the Vietnam War. So John Ford was, in the same breath, a uh, arch-traditionalist dogmatist on the question of contraception and um, extraordinarily brave and courageous and um, in the vanguard of public opinion, or in the vanguard of uh, uh, moral opinion on the question of civilian bombing. That's the same person. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to look at, so my, that's my point, you've got to look at all the whole person to come to an appreciation of, of their, uh, of how open their mind is. And, and yet uh, the, um, when you look at that, the, that church stand against contraception, think about the lives that were irreparably altered because yeah. of that judgment by the church. But also think about the lives that were lost because of our indifference to the bombing of civilians. I mean, yeah. you know, we slaughtered a couple million people with bombs between Korea, World War II and Vietnam. Um, so it's like, you know, it's like, I mean, I don't know if there's no way to do a kind of accurate moral accounting. It's just to say that here was a man who was a extraordinary moral voice in one way and who, you know, uh, by some accounts, by some some of us believe, was a less so in another way. But he's he's complicated, like all human beings. He, you, we, we can't we can't paint him with one brush. Is my point? It's interesting because I was thinking before I knew I was going to talk to you. So I'm thinking about ideas and how we look at different things. And I thought of the the debate over children coming across the border, the the southern mm. U.S. border, and um, the apprehension of those children, and the 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 fight to have them released and the and the the t the political talk around that and then the children who are in the camps um in the middle east because they're children of people who joined isis and yeah. um the difference in the sort of the world advocacy or the at least in the news in north america you know yeah. in, in terms of of how these children are characterized yeah and yeah. and they're still all just children right they're they're mm -hmm. little kids, but we, yeah. but the, the we have different opinions, or I, I pick up on different opinions, and I think probably I'm one of those people with different opinions too, you know. So then I think, okay, why? What do you have to change? Yeah, no, it is the the case for, um, you know, the, the 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 argument that all of us need to do a systematic reexamination of our positions is awfully strong. It strikes me like, yeah, there's like, there are more holes in it than we realize. You know, I hadn't even, until you mentioned that, I, that notion had never even occurred to me, but you're absolutely right. You know, one instance we're like, you cannot hold the children responsible for the actions of the parents, right? And on the other hand, we're just kind of, in the other, in, when it comes to the children of the ISIS, we're kind of uh, quiet on that very question. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you say, you know, if you look at journalists, journalists are often complicit in creating the regimented views of people and of events. Like, mm -hmm. we're some of the people who put people in those boxes and make people think about them in only one way. We characterize people, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, and here is where I differ a little bit from some of my journalistic brethren. I think that the biggest problem right now in journalism is the unanimity of opinion on a lot of subjects that um, it, a lot of journalism has become very ideologically predictable, and that's a problem. Um, you, you know, the world in America, for example, the conservatives correctly think that the media is liberal because it's liberal. You know, with the 
with some exceptions. I mean, obviously, Fox News being an exception, but it is overwhelmingly liberal. And is it does that bias the kinds of things it reports? Absolutely. Is that a problem? Yes, it is. Um, you know, it is not the job of journalists to kind of parrot the prevailing ideological line. We're supposed to be, you know, you could be several, you could be many things. You can be, we're either supposed to be, if you're, if you can pull it off, rigorously neutral, or we're supposed to be a thorn in the side of, of you know, afflict, what is it? Afflict the comfortable and com comfort, comfort, comfort the, the afflicted. afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. That's a serious, you know, you have two choices. You can be Mr. Neutral or you can be that kind of crusader. There are, if anything else, just being another mouthpiece for whatever the prevailing ideological winds are is not a good thing. It is, I, you know, there's so many things that I, uh, occasions when I see this, it's like everyone dutifully parroting a line. And I'm like, I wrote about in my book, in Talking to Strangers, I have a chapter on the, this very high profile case in America, the case of Jerry Sandusky, the, the uh, football coach at Penn State University who was convicted of, um, uh, of serial pedophilia. Um, the, if you read the popular reporting on it, 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 it is like, first of all, incredibly similar. And two, it's like, it's very clear that if you uh, do your homework in that case, that 95% of the people who write about that case have never read a word of the actual trial transcripts. They don't, they don't actually know what they're discussing. They're simply parroting a line that they read somewhere else. They have none, they don't understand any of the complexity of the case, none of the gray areas, none of what's hard or interesting or troubling about that case. And any, whenever they encounter any opinions to the contrary, they get, get on their high horse. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, what do you exactly do you know about this case? And a number of occasions with respect to that case, I can, uh, there were two occasions where I confronted journalists who had written about it with not nicely and said, no, wait a minute, you said this, but you're aware, of course, that, you know, on page 251 in the, you know, so-and-so said something which directly contradicts that, or you know, of course, that the findings of, and they, the reaction was not, oh, I should read the trial transcript. The reaction was always one of real anger at, and hostility that I had dared to challenge the kind of status quo position. And that's, that really, saddened me because that's mm. not that's not what I think journalism is about. I, I actually I see a couple of issues with that, too. I mean, one is that um, increasingly you used to have to be like really involved journalistically to report on something. You used to have to go and read those transcripts or be in the courtroom or something. Right. And uh, but now we have the technological ability to do what we used to call in TV a melt. Right. Yeah. So you get all the pictures in and you talk over them. And you, you're not there um, and you don't have the nuance. What you have is someone else's reporting and then you start to paraphrase. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so it's, it becomes the broken telephone. Yeah. And you don't even know what you don't know and you don't know that you're not reporting it completely accurately. And then it gets lost and then it gets picked up again. Yeah. With no, all the, with, with, the, with the little details gone. I remember the most striking example of this was... I remember doing an, doing a story years ago. Remember the um, Enron scandal, that uh, oil trading company in Houston, which was the darling of Wall Street, and then collapsed in a in a puddle after it was discovered that they were basically bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge scandal down here. Um, the guy who broke the scandal, I remember interviewing him because I was very curious about how he broke the scandal. And the way he broke the scandal was he read the financial filings of Enron. And then when he had a question, he called up Enron and they would you know, answer the question for him. In other words, the reason he was able to blow the whistle on Enron was that he was the first reporter ever to read the stuff that Enron themselves put out. No one else had done their homework. So literally the first guy to actually read the annual report of Enron or the 10Q of Enron and make sense of it was the guy who brought down the company. Well, and in fact, wasn't he also then discredited? Like they tried to discredit him. 
He, I that, because I, his reporting started and they tried to discredit that reporting because everybody else was on the bandwagon and Ryan's terrific. Oh, right? yes, yes. Yeah. He had, and so he had the, real trouble getting getting traction. Yes. Nobody would believe it. Other like, reporters wouldn't believe it, right? Yeah. Because the first, when you, as a journalist, when you question the status quo, sometimes the first people to jump all over you are other journalists. Are other journalists who have yes, who have a, a dog in the fight, which is their own reputation. Um, but it should be, it should be fine. It, why isn't it easier to say, particularly if you're a journalist, it should be easier to say I was wrong. It right. should be. And we don't. And, and, and yeah. but that comes up down to changing our minds again, because then someone's going to look at your uh, the, your body of work or a politician and say, well, look at how many times you changed your mind. You're not credible anymore. Right. Yeah. So your whole credibility that then is built on that you don't dare admit you might be wrong or yeah. the there's an assumption that you can't dare admit that. Yeah. yeah. And and even if it's a good thing that you admit you're wrong, someone who doesn't like you will jump on you for that. Yeah. 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 No, it's like it's funny. Um yeah, I wish it was uh I think maybe it would be easier if all of us made a practice of um when we can publicizing those incidences where we have changed our mind where we thought we were wrong. If we knew how commonplace it was, maybe we would relax our our um, our dismay when people admit to changing their mind. Yeah. I don't know. You said you're you're thick skinned. You don't worry about that. And you get, you know, you have a bigger audience than me on lots of platforms. What do you do when when people come back at you and tell you you're wrong? Uh, well, I try and figure out whether there's some some substance to their um, critiques. I mean, I think that you have to do that first. And is this real or is this just someone being nasty? Um, and if it's real, I try and figure out, well, what, you know, what, where did I go wrong? Why did I go wrong? All kinds of questions you ought to ask. Um, uh, if it's just nastiness, I, you know, I don't spend a lot of time um, worrying about it. I mean, the, the, the number, the number of people who like for totally kind of malicious reasons to um, say nasty things it turns out to be, I mean, what Twitter has shown us is that number is far larger than we would have imagined. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you ought to spend, one should spend more than um, a fraction of a second um, being upset about that kind of stuff. It's like, whatever, this is not, you know. These are not reasonable people who are lashing out in this way. It's interesting, too. If you look at Twitter, I'm not necessarily convinced that um, everybody who gets nasty on Twitter is nasty. It's just that shorthand, that that impulse. It's yeah. the way you said, you know, I thought I, I was going to say something and then I didn't as a runner. Right. And then now you would have had to apologize. Sometimes like you read something and you go, what the hell? And then you think about it. And as long as you keep your fingers off the keys... Yeah. Keep your thumbs off that smartphone. <laughs> no, it's amazing. There was, you know, going back to that example of Mary Kane, I was reading on one of my running message boards. Um, there was a whole long thread about Mary Kane. And one person said, I, he's in, he was like, it began by, he began by saying, I, I read the headline and I didn't read the article, but, and then he went on and on to denounce the article. And he admitted he hadn't read it. And I was like, dude, that's exactly what's wrong with Twitter. That somebody has a forum that allows him to, you know, that gives him license to hold forth even after he's admitted he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at least in the day when you had to write a letter to the editor, presumably the act of writing it out longhand, looking at it before and then mailing it with a stamp, presumably that prevented you from... Um, you know, making a fool of yourself. And at the other end, newspapers did not run letters. No, that and that made, just made people angrier yeah. <laughs> because they yeah. went to all that trouble. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, but, you know, maybe Twitter does change minds. Or maybe Twitter does make a lot of people think about mm. that gray area. Maybe it does change minds. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think there's any, I think the only redeeming value of Twitter is that it's more efficient distribution of dog and cat videos. And as someone who distributes dog and cat videos on Twitter, that's not a trivial thing I'm saying. It's actually quite important. But, um, you, you know, in the main, I don't think if Twitter didn't exist tomorrow, would the world wouldn't even, we would all go, I mean, everything would 
would nothing would happen. Like there would be no fallout. We wouldn't we wouldn't grind to a halt. In fact, life would probably be slightly improved. So that's the best test of what, how we would manage without it. I think we'd do just fine. Unless you're an employee of Twitter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so where do you get your ideas? Like I'm, I'm I'm interested to know how things percolate with you. Well, how do I? I don't really know. So, uh, I mean, I'm now in idea, as my book tour is winding down, I now have to come up with ideas for my season five of Revisionist History. And so I'm in that process right now. Um, in the beginning, it's very, you know, I read books and think deep thoughts and have big themes that I want to explore. And I have a long list that I make. And then... But those are never the best ones. The best ones are always the ones that that are really kind of haphazard and emerge in the moment and are unpredictable. So it's all very hair-raising because I have to have them all done by June, let's say. And typically in at the end of April or the beginning of May, I still have, you know, three shows that I haven't even that I don't even know what they're gonna be. And so I'm just in a blind panic. Um, and I don't, so I don't, you know, at that point, anyone who tells me anything even remotely interesting, it gets turned into a show. <laughs> I mean, you really kind of get, and weirdly, they're often the best ones. So there isn't, there isn't a formal process and there isn't a team of people looking. There's just sort of me randomly rooting around. But I do, I now, you know, you know, you go to... Th because it's audio, you go to databases with lots of audio and you listen to things or you you think about stories that have a strong audio component or voices that are powerful. Or And then there's a whole period where you just expose yourself to as many interesting things as possible with the hope that something will percolate. Um, there's a woman, she's actually um, been in an episode before, but for years, though, her name was Barb. Barb Stuckey. Barb works at a, uh, a, an, a food R&D lab outside of San Francisco. And I first discovered Barb, I, don't, I mean, more than 10 years ago. And periodically, I just go and visit Barb and find out what Barb's up to. And she's invariably up to something fun and hilarious. Like the last time I was there, she was obsessed with... Um, uh, with uh, Oh my God, what was it? With a particular Indian, she was on this whole riff about a particular oh, um, uh, Indian sauce, um, not mango chutney, but I've forgotten. One of those kind of, and her whole argument, what she'd done is she'd gathered every single variety of this sauce sold in both the United States, I feel, and India. And her point was that everything, that the range of tastes covered by the single sauce name was like so large to be absurd. In other words, we, people acted as if there was such a thing as whatever it was, tandoori sauce or whatever. I've forgotten what, which one she was using. But in actual fact, when you tasted all of these things, you realize, no, no, there's no agreement whatsoever, which is sort of hilariously Indian, that they would be hiding a lo below the cover of of apparent cultural unanimity is, in fact, unbelievable and hilarious diversity, right? Uh -huh. And if you like, no, I have lots of Indian friends. If you know Indians, you know that this is the great fun thing about being an Indian, that there's a cultural construct called Indian, which means nothing, right? Which is <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's a word used to describe the most unbelievably diverse set of languages, cultures, ge geographies, you know, go on and on, and food. Right. So that was her. And, you know, that was just that was the last time I saw Barb. I didn't end up using that yet, although I have all the tape. But like I start paying visits um, to people like her to see what's on their mind, because, you know, like some percentage of the time they'll tell you something absolutely uh, brilliant. That, that you hadn't thought of and that you know that no one else has thought of. And then you can well, unless they hang out explore with Barb. the story. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. Barb, you know, she views her entire uh, world through the prism of a she's a she's a food scientist. But more than that, she's a food. Her job is to experiment for big food companies and make them things, which is just a, an incredibly interesting perspective on um, the world. Like, you know, her. 
I don't know. She's just she. I, I did the revisionist history episode on French fries um, with Barb. She was the one who made, who recreated um, uh, early early days McDonald's French fries, so we could taste how good they were when they <laughs> used beef tallow. But that was that was a project we did together. That was really fun. So, are there? You say sometimes you go and look at the audio. Can you give me an example of something you wouldn't have done? This you wouldn't have done, but you heard the audio and you thought. I have to do this? Uh, yeah. I did a long thing about Sammy Davis Jr. Um, and he was roasted on one of those TV, you know, uh, celebrity roasts. And I know nothing about Sammy Davis Jr. Never much too young to have been around in his heyday. Um, and didn't even, you know, never even crossed my mind. And then I, a friend of mine said, you got to listen to this. And it was a celebrity roast, Sammy Davis Jr. from the early seventies. And it, the audio, the tape is just so weird and egregious and distressing and bizarre that I just had to do something. I mean, there's just no... I just knew instantly that's a show. I don't know what the show is. I have no clue what I'm gonna, where I'm doing with this, but I remember this just episode. So much. I remember this. You keep remember going. This keep one? going. Yeah. yeah. Keep going. Yeah. I just knew that there was, and what's weird is, my friend Charles, who's a screenwriter and very much more sophisticated than I am on things Hollywoody, his kind of conclusion from watching that tape ended up being diametrically opposed to mine. So it wasn't that he gave me the point or the moral. Or the conclusion, he just gave me that. He just said, you have to listen. I found this on YouTube. You got to listen. And I listened. And I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, it was because it just had everything you want. It had, it had this very, it was this very, very particular cultural moment. It was this very compelling scene involving lots of very famous people. There was a lot in it that was genuinely hilarious. And there was a lot in it that was genuinely distressing. And then at the center of it, you had this character who, as I learned, Sammy Davis Jr., was an extraordinarily complicated and um, uh, uh, a guy who lived, who had a life that I think of as being um, incredibly difficult by virtue of just the era that he inhabits. I mean, he comes of age in the Jim Crow, you know, segregated era in American life, and then he comes to fame right before civil rights movement. And he just has to deal with things that, you know, today entertainers of his ilk just don't have to deal with. And it just made him this incredibly sympathetic and compelling figure. Um, anyway, that's a case where you know, if I if I was, I would never have never have written an article about that. Never, I would have done it, but I could do a podcast about it because I had. It's the it's you have to hear him, and hear all the people roasting him to get it. Um, I think. So audio changed your mind. Oh, I'm now. You know, you're you're an old pro in audio. I'm not. I'm a I'm a Johnny Come Lately. So. Never I, too I, late. Never too late to open your late. ears. <laughs> <laughs> but I am now a complete convert to the magic of audio. I, I, I'm rapidly losing interest in print, and I really only want to do audio now. It's just so much, so fascinating to me. It's, well, it's it, for me. I started in radio, and I moved to television, and I worked with pictures for like two decades, and then yeah. to move back to audio, I became like a new convert. It was like people would say, "Do you miss working with pictures?" And I'd say, "Actually, no," because yeah. there's there's a richness. I always I always tell people that you don't when you listen, you don't see words on a page, and you don't hear words. You you hear and then you see images like your mind just works differently and it, yeah. your mind opens up. I always get yeah. great ideas when I'm listening. I never get ideas when I'm watching because I have to use everything I've got and focus on the screen. But when I'm listening, a little piece of my brain, not listening to you right now, I'm fully focused. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm listening to something, a little piece of my brain can wander because something that I'm listening to makes me think and then yeah. I can go back to it later. But yeah. it's got that ability and you've yeah. made the point the, of the emotion that comes through audio. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not even close, is it? It's just, 
the your ability to kind of tap into people's deepest feelings and move them um, with audio is is just extraordinary. And it's nothing. I didn't know this. I mean, I had been dealing in the kind of rarefied air of print where you can do a lot kind of analytically and narratively, but not emotionally. It's really hard to write an emotional. I mean, unless you're an incredibly, it's why we revere great fiction writers so much because we understand that what they are doing is nearly impossible, right? They're, whereas in audio, I mean, whole different story. I mean, you can move people to tears as a matter of course. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of fantastic. But and it's you know when you you talk in talking to strangers about um, when people talk to each other and they 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 see a stranger and they look at them and they look in their in, in their eyes and they can mm-hmm. get they can get a lot of cues wrong they can just misunderstand yeah. and sometimes when you think about it, if you got headphones on or not even but if you're just listening to someone you hear things in their voice that they can't hide because we know how to maybe make our eyes look stoic or something but we don't know how to stop our voice from quavering we don't know how to um we don't know how to control our panic or mm-hmm. yeah well you know it is the case that social scientists would tell you that if you are interested in figuring out whether someone is lying to you you are better off not seeing them so you are better off just listening to them um or even better yet some would even say just read the transcript but listening it is clear that whatever cues you're getting, the whatever visual cues you're getting are not helping you in that process. They're they are impairing your ability to see to, to correctly judge the veracity of the communication. And then there's the silences, right? What what is said in the silent in that moment of pause. Yeah. Before someone yeah. actually answers or as they think about what they might say. It's it's amazing to me, by the way, how many very successful investors I know who take this to heart and tell you they will never meet. They make a point of never meeting in person the heads of companies that they're they're thinking of investing in. So how do they decide? They listen to them and they look at the, or they just analyze the company's documents. What you don't want is the charismatic CEO distorting your rational analysis, right? You don't want to fall in love with that person, as we would tend to do. And let that color your your kind of um, hard edged um, understanding of whether the company is a good one or not. This gets back to the journalism, right? I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about we work and the yeah. the build up. Like you talked about Enron, but we just saw it again, right? The build up, the journalistic build up of a of a rock star venture capital. Um, yeah. and, you know well, this 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 startup that that had nothing underneath. Half the Journalists in New York and, and Silicon Valley writing enthusiastically about WeWork were writing from WeWork offices, right? They're all, all these like, you know, dot-com investor or something, something. They're all in WeWorks. I mean, my company's in a WeWork. Like, it's kind of hard to be objective about the phenomenon of WeWork when you are filing your story from a WeWork, a re- an office rendered from WeWork. You Did know, they like, put that in the story? No, of course not. Um <laughs> You know, it's like a... Uh, I, I shouldn't a, laugh. I shouldn't laugh. That They should have. Yeah, they should, they should, yeah, they should have. Yeah. This, this piece was done from where we were. But um, yeah. No, I mean, I go to I go to our Pushkin offices and we work all the time. And it's like, it becomes, I have friends who work for WeWork. You know, these, these things, these, these facts and associations do make it, do, do have the, uh, the effect of clouding our vision. And so when we hear people be dismissive of journalism and news and we hear people talk about fake news and and I get my back up right away, of course. But then I go, well, what is it about the way we've been doing journalism that lets people that gives people that space to make that argument to people who aren't sure? Well, because journalism is hard. So any profession that's hard is going to attract should attract um criticism. Um, well, this, I mean, there's that part. The other thing is that when, also when journalism is properly doing its job, it is by nature controversial. If your job is to comfort the afflicted and f- afflict the comfortable, then the comfortable who have means are going to get upset. That's that's a sign you're doing your job. Um, the one thing I, so I, I'm not like, um, 
I don't get mad at journalists if they attract criticism. I, I think that's either a sign they're doing things right or simply a recognition of the fact that the job of being a fair, effective journalist is always difficult. And so there's always going to be room for criticism. What I don't share is those who, uh, who from within the profession get all gloom and doomy and say they're going to you know, shut us down. Actually, I don't think they're going to shut us down. I think it's fine. I think the institution of journalism is very, very well established in um, places like Canada, the United States, and England. And it's no one's shutting it down anytime soon. We're we're going to be fine. And parenthetically, this kind of political turmoil that many countries are in is really good for has made journalists journalists a lot of money, right? I mean, the New York Times, there's a reason why the New York Times is talking about potentially reaching 10 million digital subscriptions in the next few years, which is an astronomically high number, right? It's because of Trump. Right? Well, journalism matters. You know, suddenly yes, it journalism matters. matters. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's not like, so this is all, I think that, that journalism is in an extraordinarily healthy place right now. I, 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 can't, I can't think of a time where, where we mattered more. And we just have to accept the fact that when you are central to the, I mean, think about the importance of journalism, for example, in the political discussion right now in America. It is journalists who are, who have been carrying forward the, um, the investigation into the, the administration of Donald Trump, right? Absent the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and the New York Times and countless others, half of the stuff we know now, we wouldn't know. So, like, they're at the center. I mean, this is like, this is the most extraordinary moment in modern journalism in a very long time. And we should be, those of us who are in the profession should be correctly proud of what we're doing right now. It's amazing. But what, along with that, are we preaching to the choir or are we, are we changing minds? Well, at the moment, I don't think your job, and I've said this about my own writing as well, I don't think our job in the first order of things is to change minds. I think our job is to start a conversation. It is up to others. We are supposed to put, we put the information and the ideas and the frameworks and the concepts out there. And it's the rest of the world's job to make something of them. I would agree with um, you. It's, it, yeah. it's our job to tell you what's happening and yeah. to give it some context mm -hmm. and to uh, give, it, uh, give it some like a full understanding of what's going on so that you can make an informed decision. Yeah, exactly. but we're up against again that what you brought up at the very beginning, which is you know people who think they know. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, that's not my job to convince people who think they know. They have to. Con it's they have to do that that work themselves, don't and they? And also, our time horizons for convincing. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about climate change. You know, we just have a, I think, an unreasonable expectation that the rest of the world is going to catch up with us. So as journalists, I immerse myself in a topic, you know, every day for however long, and then I publish stuff. I can't turn around and get upset because my readers aren't on the same page as me within 24 hours of me publishing the article, right? They haven't been immersed in it. They're not single-minded about it. They're weighing that with a million other things. Give them time. Um, if we have a more generous um, uh, give people a more generous runway to make sense of the world, I think they will, in large part, um, start to make intelligent choices. But we just can't expect it to happen tomorrow. You talk about your dad and climate change. Is uh, he was? Uh, why was he already um, well along in understanding that? Well, he was a, an environmentalist from the get-go. He was a, a passionate sort of outdoorsman and he started a uh, he was he started recycling leaves in our hometown of Elmira in the early 70s which gives you a sense of he had solar panels by the 80s he was you know it's like he was this is stuff he cared about so this it made it made perfect sense that you know he was a man who went for long walks in nature whenever he could um, so this was he this was squarely these were squarely the kinds of things that he um, thought about all the time. So it, made, it makes sense that it would begin with him, you know. Mm -hmm. The last time I talked to you, we talked about your dad. He had just died. He had just died, yeah. It will be uh, three years this March. Hmm. But, yeah. You miss him? I do. He was, uh, I was just, uh, we were recording a little thing this morning, and I was telling a, a uh, 
funny Graham Glabble story. He, he, he was such a, a uh, uh, it's funny, it, it's largely, in, I realized he was a, a character when he was alive, but it's, it's with the perspective of his passing in time that I, my, I, that I realized just what a hilarious character he was. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was, he had a very, very lovely and unusual way of thinking about things, which um, I hope in some small part I have inherited. Hmm. It's a nice thing to think about. Huh? Yeah. Do you think about your own mortality after losing your dad? Uh, not really. Because no, no, I don't. I'm not someone. I don't really. I'm. I. But I don't ever think about the future. So, I. I'm very. I only. I think about like the next six hours, and that's about it. So, um, I've always sort of been that way. Um, and if you that, if you don't, if you don't dwell too much on tomorrow, I don't think you get caught up in those questions of mortality. I don't. By the way. I don't know, but I never got the sense that my father was terribly future focused either, um, or either of my parents for that matter. Um, so I don't. Uh, um, no, it's just not a. This is not the way I'm. I'm constituted. Hmm. Now, see that I'm going to tell you that uh, you said that I'm looking through the glass in my studio and their eyes all get wide. See, because I guess they have a a view of Malcolm Gladwell that you're always thinking about. Everything, including the future. <laughs> no, we've, I mean, we've, we've, we've already personal. given you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> in terms of my, I can tell you, you know, that I have an appointment tomorrow at 1245. And I can tell you that I will go to the gym around five o'clock tomorrow. But then, and I have a doctor's appointment. But that's as, as far that's as far as I've gone on, on the future. That's it. It's like, I got those three things tomorrow. The rest we're going to make up. But in terms of your work, you're already yeah. noodling. Are you not? Like I am, thinking I am, about things? I am noodling and I'm trying out. So I'm in a stage where I'm trying out. So if we had another, you know, two hours, I would, I would try out one of my, one of my uh, revisions history ideas on you. I would say, all right, what do you think of this? And then I would like... Can you, me, oh, can you give me a little hint? Can you try something <laughs> out on me? I want, I, want to be, I want to be a Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> guinea pig. <laughs> Nope, not on the air. I okay, can't be you can't do it on the air. Tell the whole world about it. Okay, but I mean, no, I'm at the stage. Where I, I, I'm I will running respect things. this. <laughs> I'm running things by people, and seeing what they, and also the process, which you discover. I was, I was, I did the, uh, as one does, and you know, in my endless book tour, I did the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, you know, like the most popular podcast mm -hmm. in the world, um, and he's a comedian, and we were talking. He was talking about. Um, the comedians have a cycle, and in his case, the cycle is two years. Every two years, he does a special, and when he finishes the special, he then starts writing jokes, and then for about a year, he's, he kind of grooms the jokes, and he goes and does small comedy clubs and things, and try, you know, a lot of comedians do this, and they go through this process of, and they, he was talking about how um, slavishly he follows the direction of the audience. So if a, if a joke doesn't work, and, and he says they rarely work in the beginning. So you go out to the comedy store or whatever in L.A. and he says, does his little 15-minute routine. And when a joke doesn't work, you don't blame the audience. It's like, oh, that doesn't work. I'm not there yet. And he's like, you will sometimes hone a line for months and months and months and months and months until you get it right. And that resonates. I don't do that to that extreme, but that resonated me, with me because I find myself in this pay, stage of the idea process. I'm running versions of an idea past people until I, there's something I see they respond to. And if they don't respond, I throw it out. I'm like, try it again. Let's do it this way. You know, are you gonna... What response are you looking for? I'm like, looking he's looking for, for a laugh. What are you looking for? What are you, are you looking I'm for looking that? For, uh, I'm looking for someone saying, ha. Huh. That's what I'm looking for. Ha. Huh. Some combination of interest and surprise. Um, I can't, the one thing I hate is, oh, that's, I, I heard that, or that's like that thing I heard in it. <laughs> and that's over. We don't it's do like, that. Yeah. Okay. It's already out. Yeah. Okay. I get that. Or huh. when they chime in and say, <laughs> they, they think they're supporting you and they say something which suggests that they didn't understand anything you said. And then you realize, oh, I'm not doing this right. I'm, you know, 
I'm doing a bad job. You can't have that kind of, you can't miss the mark. Do you have a trusted group of people around you who you run these ideas by, or will you do it with random strangers or like I do not it random? With a like... broad, well, you have to be in the circle, but it's not a. I'm not returning to the same people over and over again. I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying things out in different contexts, or even trying. Sometimes I'll sneak a little piece of it into a conversation, particularly if I think that the kind of person I'm talking to might have something genuinely useful to add. So it's, you know, some very often the second kind of crucial step in an argument comes because I gave the first step to some person who I thought would have something interesting to add to it. And they do. They go, oh, and then they go, duh, 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 duh. they tell you this second thing. And you're like, oh, that's it. I never thought about that. And then um, or I hadn't heard about, you know, that particular little piece. And then off you go. Is that different from how you write? Yeah. And research? It is more because I'm telling a podcast is about telling someone a story very in the most direct way imaginable. Then you really can test it out by telling someone a story, right? With writing, you're not the the problem with doing that with writing is that actually the act of telling someone a story in words using your voice is profoundly different from writing it out on a page. So there's a limited amount of value in you're switching modes and a lot is lost. Something can completely work on the page and not work as a oral story. Whereas here I'm I'm quite literally replicating the 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 process of listening to my podcast when I tell you we're going for a walk and I I was in LA and I have a friend in LA who's a very, very smart screenwriter actress. And we always go for a walk. And I saw her two weeks ago. We went for this long walk in Griffith Park. And I, this happened like five times to the point where, and I did it for her, to the point where we finished the walk, we both took out, we ran to the car, took out a pen, and both of us made like 10 minutes of notes. <laughs> <laughs> like she said all these things like, and she didn't realize she was helping me. And I didn't realize I was helping her, but both of us were like, oh my gosh, I can't do anything. Don't say anything. And we were like scribbling away furiously. And then we went and we had lunch. That's a great friendship. It is a very good, it is a very good friendship. This is, um, this is, uh, did you ever see the show on Netflix, The OA? No. Oh, it was kind of a cult, very successful kind of cult, uh, calling it sci-fi doesn't quite do it justice, but she was the creator along with her friends all of that show. So they're just enormously creative person who's, but not in my world. And so insanely useful uh, to run ideas by because she's not, she doesn't have the same set of cultural reference that I do. So she'll come up with something that's like could, totally foreign to me that's really amazing. So that's about stretching your mind, not just changing yes. your mind, stretching so your mind. That's what, I mean, I think she's a delightful person, like going for walks with her. But the, the reason, there is a kind of very practical reason to do that. And that is because she reads different things. She thinks about different things. She's a, you know... She's a, a, uh, a very serious feminist working in Hollywood who, if she named the last 20 things she read, I have read none of them. Like, so it's just, you know, like, it's so it's fascinating to kind of run ideas through her kind of mental mill. And she has um, consistently unexpected responses. And this is for your audio work that you do this, or is this for your writing as well? Yeah, I, I do it way more now that I started doing the podcast, just because I'm realizing how incredibly... I used to always do it. I have a friend named Charles, who's my neighbor. And I used to, I've always done it. Charles and I always go out to dinner on sort of Sunday nights. And I always, on the drive there and dinner and then the drive back... I run things by him and he does the same. So I've always done that with him, but he's much closer to my world. And uh, whereas I now realize, oh, I should kind of um, try and do this much more with people who are outside my world. Those but are just, nice things. That's, that's a great thing to know about you. Yeah, it is a kind of, uh, uh, it, is, it has been a lovely discovery. 
It's a, do you do you feel like you're starting like like a whole new career with this? It's a, uh, there's oh, a continuation, much. but also like you're renewing something or feels totally different. Feels like I mean, even with talking to strangers, talking to strangers, we did the audiobook like a podcast, you know, with real tape and scoring and and you know, everyone I interviewed, I you you hear their voice. I mean, it's this totally different experience. It felt like a very did not feel like writing a book. I mean, I just did something different that I, and because I knew I was going to do that, I wrote the book in a different way. I mean, it really does feel like I started over at my advanced age. Your advanced age. Did you think that you would be the success that you are? Oh, no. I mean, I'm. Yeah. Was that your I mean, goal? But again, that's about the future. I never thought about it. I just it never even occurred to me. I just kind of assumed I was concerned with doing something that I liked and uh, concerned with doing being my own boss but i never thought about um never even occurred to me that uh i would be this i would have this degree of public success and is it uh, do you like it do you find it um uncomfortable at times or is it is it great well i mean I'm not someone who likes talking excessively about myself or my own, particularly my own feelings. So, and I'm quite private. So I, I don't like the invasions of, you know, you every now and again you realize, oh, when you're in the public eye, people speculate about you in ways that is a little uncomfortable. But then the pluses so outweigh the minuses. So I don't really have any complaints. So I'm not going to ask you too many questions about yourself because <laughs> you won't answer, will you? <laughs> I'm very good at, I, I've gotten very good at uh, dodging. Deflecting? Uh, deflecting. That's what we do. That's yeah. what you, that's what you learn. Yeah, because you learn about how to get it, how to get other people's stories out of them. But I learned that too, you know. <laughs> it's fun though, you know, in all of these, so the book tour now, book tours have now become going on podcasts, right? That's what mm -hmm. used to be that you went. To bookstores and read. No one goes to a bookstore and read anymore. I mean, I haven't done that in 10 years, 15 years. Now, but now it's totally transformed. You go, so it's really, it's become actually really fun in a way that I, I had not, it wasn't fun. You know, when, when I did my book tour for my book Blink, that wasn't fun. That was giving the same speech every night for three months. That was like a nightmare. This, it's like, you never know. Like you have these conversations and everyone's different and you, they last much longer and you go in unexpected directions. And it's like, I don't know, it's kind of like you look forward to it, which is such a weird notion that I would look forward to something on a book tour. This is historic. That's great. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and you deflected. We were going <laughs> to, but that's okay. Um, I just love talking to you. Thank you. This was really fun. It was fun for yeah. me too. Oh, good. I'm going to look for the next idea in revisionist history. I'm going to listen for it. <laughs> well, should we ever go on a long walk, I will give you, uh, I will run a couple of ideas by you, and then I will come back and scribble notes furiously, writing down everything you have to say. And I will, gar I will guarantee you I'll be scribbling notes too, but I will not <laughs> be recording anything, okay? Okay. okay. Malcolm Gladwell, the man who is forever changing his mind. I think he changed it a few times in that conversation. He says you should change your mind about one significant thing every day. I don't know. I'm going to think about that. And while I do, what about you? What was the last big thing you changed your mind about? You can tweet me. I'm on Twitter, at A.M. Tremonti. Make sure to use the hashtag more with A.M.T. Thanks for listening in today. More is hosted by me, Anna Maria Tremonti. The series is produced by Jennifer Morose. Our associate producer and sound designer is Arman Agbali. Special thanks to Catherine Stockhausen, Laura Antonelli, Austin Pomeroy, and Andrew Norton for all their help on more. Our digital producer is Fabiola Carletti. Our video producers are Phil Lung and Evan Agard. Tanya Springer is the senior producer of CBC Podcasts, and Arif Narani is our executive producer. This is the end of our run. So if you haven't caught all the conversations, you still have some listening to do. You can find them all in our feed. And if you're all caught up, thanks for joining me on this ride. It's been a blast. And keep an ear out. This isn't the last you're going to hear from me in this space. Mm -hmm.